Hi. Welcome to the lecture on the material for Chapter 2 in Net 125. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how do I configure uh, at least general terms, uh, the makeup of Cisco equipments, how to configure them, a uh, little bit of the operating systems. We've all dealt with computers and what do we got? We point, click, mouse, pull down windows and stuff. Modifying data and software on a Cisco switch or router is a little bit different. Uh, uh, for some of you, maybe call it old school. Uh, so it's a lot of typing in command line interface. So it's, I'm typing something on a command line to make things happen. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do this configuration and just get you started. This configure this lecture will apply both to the switches, which are probably our first physical piece of equipment that we'll deal with, and later when it gets to routers. Um, so what you're going to learn today will apply to both, and as the semester unwinds, we'll be adding other commands into your command repertoire uh, to be able to modify switches and routers. So let's talk a little bit about how to configure a network operating system, uh, particularly probably on a switch to start with. So just to give you a high level of what some of the objectives are. Is one, we're going to talk about what iOS, inter what an operating system is. Um, what's Cisco's purpose, what it's going to be used for, how to access it, how to navigate it, what is its command structure done. And then we'll talk about how do I actually make some initial configuration changes. Uh, there's probably like half a dozen that I recommend we do every single lab, every single piece of equipment you get, um, and we'll talk about that. And one of the homework assignments will give you that uh, practice to do that. And then the last thing is I got to make sure that I can have two devices talk to each other. So I need to make sure I have a, uh, an addressing scheme so that devices know how to get access to each other. So we'll talk a little bit about how to connect those two devices and how to test if you've got that connection. So let's look at uh, some basic interface, of, you know, commands here. So Cisco's iOS is, it's, that iOS stands for Inter-network operating system. Um, although Apple uses the term iOS, uh, iOS is actually a registered trademark by Cisco. So it's kind of uh, interesting. But as you can tell, they got Cisco wanted to make sure that hey guys, <laughs> we're the ones that came up with it first. But every electronic device that we have, whether it's our phone or PC, all of it has some type of software that's running it. And they're basically all made up the same. Uh, every device has some hardware that it's trying to control, uh, electronics, hard drives, uh, memory chips. Uh, then there is what they call a kernel, an operating system kernel, which acts, you know, directly interfaces to the hardware and manages how that hardware then deals with and interfaces with software. And then you've got the shell. And it's basically either a command line interface or a graphical user interface that allows the user to interface with the kernel. So you got the hardware and you got some software that interfaces directly with the hardware and the inter interface between the hardware and the software and then something between you and the device. So what's the purpose of an iOS? Well, using a GUI, you, you, you're pretty much using your mouse like I'm doing right now. I move my mouse and kind of make changes and it allows me to enter text. And we've done that forever. Whether it's texting something, whether it's using a mouse on a, an Apple or a uh, Microsoft PC, we've done it a lot. Now, what we probably haven't done is a lot of command line interfaces, which pretty much means it's keyboard. I'm running some basic commands and it's just typing on a keyboard to have that access between. So, and they're all text-based, no graphics. So it'll be a little different. Now, some of you have may have, that may have had a Linux class, some of the ways that at least the college here teaches Linux is from the command line interface perspective. Because most operating systems always have the graphical user interface, but it's what's behind the scenes that sometimes 
a little bit more exciting, at least for our geeks. And there are definitely some different versions or variations of the Cisco iOS switches and routers and stuff, but there are some that are some devices that are a little bit different. But for the most part, what you're going to learn today and stuff on switches and routings for this class will be just fine. Now, here you've got, they do have a, uh, some come with a default iOS, but actually some will actually say, hey, I need to upgrade or download my iOS. And Cisco has, you know, you have this download software. It's pretty much like any other application um, that you can download and upgrade when software is, is required. And if you're going to stay in the networking field very long, you will probably upgrade software on your switches and routers uh, your entire career. Uh, so uh, just know that it isn't just that we would send you a CD or a set of CDs to install software. It's pretty much like if you wanted to upgrade your software on your PC. So now this course we use, we're using release 15.x. Um, so we'll get into that, how to determine what release your device is on or how to determine that and, and go from there. So now how do I access the iOS? Well, there's three common types. There's console port, which basically is a serial port, and it's just out of band, but it pretty much means I've got to physically connect to that device to be able to connect. So I can't log in remotely to make that modification. So that console, I've got a cable that's a serial cable. I'm going to plug into a physical device type it into my laptop and be able to do the initial configuration. There is a secure shell, which is an in-band, which is I can access it through a network remotely and it's, can, can, you know, to establish a uh, command line interface session. So I'm going to log in remotely to actually make physical modifications to a device. Uh, You'll be prompted for password, uh, you know, your username, passwords, what commands are there, anything going across the internet or the network that you're doing will be encrypted. And it is probably the best practice to use Secure Shell if you're going to remotely modify devices. Now, there is a process like Telnet that allows me to remotely access devices. But the key here is over network that all of the authentication, lost my mouse, all that authentication is plain text, which basically means it you can see it. So if you're watching what's going across the airways or off over the network, you'll actually see the login, the password, and any data you're sending. It's not encrypted. You can read it. So let's just say it's not the best secure way to update modifications. So how do I do this? Well, because when you look at networking devices, there are no keyboards and monitors. So the question is, how do I access it? How do I do this? Well, what we do that via access it via a terminal emulation program. Uh, there's a couple out here, and there's two listed here, Putty and TerraTerm. Uh, I've used them both. I, I personally like Putty, but personal preference. Uh, there are several else out there you can find on, you know, Google it and find several. You can pick and choose which ones you like. Uh, I think a lot of the labs probably will lean more to, yeah, I think, I don't think they give you, demand you to use one over the other. Um, so you got a choice. So, but they're a program that allows me to pretty much emulate a keyboard or a terminal. So, that's kind of what we're going to do here. So now Cisco has what they call a hierarchical command structure. That means that at each layer or each level in this hierarchy, I'm allowed only certain commands. So that way I can set permissions. I can set, you know, who can modify what. Maybe I only want people looking and observing. I don't want them to be able to make changes. So this hierarchical layout or of op modes of operation allowed me to protect and 
change some things. So there's basically two major exec modes. There's a user exec mode and a privilege exec mode. The user exec mode allows me basically to just view what's there. I can see it. I can log in. I can see it. But I, there's nothing else you can really do with it. So I can just kind of observe things. I can't make any physical modifications. But if I want to make a change to the, my device, I need to be in a privileged exact mode. Now the question is, well, how do I tell which of these two modes I'm in? Well, when you first log in, the de default is going to be, you're going to be tell right here by that greater than sign. When you see that greater than sign, that means I'm in the, the user exec mode. It means I can only view information. So what kind of commands do you think I'm only going to be able to see there are ones that can list information that's on my device. But guess what? I'm probably not going to give you access to list everything like passwords, usernames. So there are some restriction, but it's still a view only. Now to be in that privilege mode, You'll see this, it's now it's a pound sign. So after you've typed in what we call the enable mode, so if I type in the enable command at the user exec level, so I'll type in, you'll know, see the switch, and I'll say, okay, type in enable. If I know the password, the username and password, I will be put into privilege mode, and my prompt will change, and you'll see this greater than sign. Now, the primary configuration is basically used to make changes. It's called global configuration. Now, to get in this global configuration mode, one, I've got to be in privileged mode because I'm going to make a modification. And two, I've got to say, okay, what am I doing? I am going to configure something. So I'm going to say, I'm going to configure the terminal. Now, you're these are some old terms, but it basically means I want to make physical changes to the switch or the router that I'm connected to. So that's one thing. So you, one of the things you're going to first log in, you're going to power up your switch. You're going to get your user config mode prompt, greater than sign. You're going to type in enable, type in your login and password. Your prompt's going to change. Then you're going to say, I want to configure this to, I want to configure this device. So I want to say configure terminal or a short cut to that would be config C O N F T space T. Uh, I think I'm going to post a, a, another video as some, so you can actually see some of this in action, but I thought it would help you out this time. And then because this is hierarchical layers, now this is, I want to decide, there's certain commands that only affect certain parts of the device I'm connected to. Some of them are going to be global, affect the entire switch, but some changes and modifications will happen only to a particular interface. So I want to assign a, a, an address or a password or something to a particular address or port on this device. Now I get into the interface or a sub configuration mode and one of them is interface mode and another one is line mode. And because I'm going further down this left, I'm going to get less and less commands. I'm going to get different commands available at each of these layers. Now, how do I navigate between different modes? I can, so I can move in and out. So one to move from user mode to privilege mode is the enable command to get out of the enable command, you can just type in disable, will get you back out of that privilege mode. Um, but there are other various modes. You can type in the exit command to move to a, from a previous mode to a more generic mode, uh, so interface to global. You can type in an end command, which will get you out of the global configuration mode no matter what happens, or a control Z, or which works the same as an end command. Uh, the more and more you play with this, you're going to use uh, keyboard shortcuts. And as we unload, you know, lay those out, you'll, you'll see those. But control Z is one to the same thing as an end. It pretty much gets you out of that global configuration mode. And it pretty much works everywhere. Now, 
you still continue with the iOS mode. So, so I entered a privilege mode by typing the enable command. Now I want to enter the global configuration. So I want to make physical changes. So I type in a configure terminal command or the conf space T command. The prompt will change and we'll show you that a little bit later. And if you're looking at the website, we're going through this, you know, looking at the presentations that are done on Netacad, you'll see those demonstrations. Uh, if I want to get to the interface, so I want to make a change to one particular interface, you type an interface and then the address of the interface. And here you're seeing an address here of FA0 slash 1. So it's fast Ethernet 0 slash 1. So it's I think it's port port one you know, on bay one, uh, bay zero. So you get, and this can be abbreviated to int. So now to get out of each of these config sub configuration mode, the exit command. If I want to get totally out of configuration, type in the end or the control Z. Now, what is the basic configuration of a, of a Cisco? iOS command. So here you got an example. You got a switch. Now you're at the user interface mode. So it's got show IP address. So you got the prompt. And being um, a, a hierarchical layer, Cisco changes its prompt to show you the different layer, what layer, what can, what layer, or if this hierarchical layout you're in. So you're going to pay attention to which what your prompt is telling you. So it's going to help you know this. Then you've got your command. You've got a different command. You got it's got a command, a space. You don't need a space between the greater than or pound sign, but you need a space between the command and any sub arguments that it has. Uh, in this case, you got a keyword and some arguments. Yeah, another example here. Here's your ping command, a space, and then in this case, it's got an address. So it's got an argument. So, so you got a keyword, an argument. Keyword is a specific primer defining the operating system. You know, defined in it, so it's a special keyword, special name, and then an argument. It's not predefined. It's pretty much what you're going to enter. And then once you finish that command, you will enter, hit the enter command key, sorry, to submit that command. Now, there's a few other things as far as you look at documentation and help notes. Um, so look at you got, so if it's bold, indicates that you are entering it, it has to be entered exactly as it is. If it's in italics, it says what arguments you're allowed to. Square block brackets means it's optional. The braces indicate it's a required element. And then if you've got braces in vertical lines, means it indicated a choice. So this means it got a choice of Y or Z. Uh, so a couple of examples that I'll let you pay attention to later. Now, iOS is not going to leave you high and dry and force you to read a book all the time. It does have what they call context-sensitive help. Uh, context of it, it says, I'm going to give you help based on where you're currently at. Um, so to access it, you can just hit a question mark. Enter a question mark at any prompt, and it'll tell you what's available at the layer you're in in the system. Um, now, it also does a quick syntax check. Um, so the syntax check to sex starts from left to right to determine if what you're asking for is being done. If for some reason the interpreter can't determine it, it's going to give you a little up arrow uh, indicating where and then kind of tell you some either it's ambiguous, so maybe there, you need to have more data, the, inc the command's incomplete or incorrect. Sometimes those messages aren't always the clearest, but it's an indicator to you that something isn't quite right and you need to maybe hit the question mark to determine it. Now, so there are always some hot keys and here's what I talk about the, you know, variation. So if you can type in configure, 
to CIO and F. If for some reason there's another command that starts with those three letters, you're going to have to get, there's only so short you can make a command if we start matching up, you know, if it starts becoming ambiguous, then I can't tell between configure and another command. So just know that you can shorten these commands up, and I'll try to point out the uh, shortcuts as time goes on. Now, there are some hotkeys and shortcuts. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but the ones that you I like to use a lot are definitely Control-Z. Control-A gets me to the beginning of the line, and then, of course, the arrow keys allow me to stroll back and forth. Uh, so those are beneficial. Now, one of the packet tracer example is I want to navigate this with you. Uh, I'm going to pick and choose which of these class, and it, and it may be, yeah, I'll, I'll put another video together on out of the three assignments you got, which one I'll pick to, to make a video. But just know that there's something on one of the labs you can do is talk about navigation. Um, I may pick, well, we'll see. And here's one on establishing consoles. But I'm more concerned about, we'll do a little bit of the console, but since you're only doing with Packet Tracer, it, it's fairly straightforward on configuration. But the basic configuration is probably where I'll probably find a lab that, you, that I'll pick on. So now, one of the things you want to do is, since you have multiple devices in most networks, is i got to make sure I put a name on it. I want to make sure that... Uh, I mean, because the default, when you first turn a switch on, is it's called switch. If I have 20 switches in my network, and they all have the name switch, it may make it very difficult to know where the mistakes are. So you want to make sure that you can create a name for a switch that makes it easy to find and easy to troubleshoot. So how do we do that? Well, we do that with the host name. So here you see an example. The host name command is what changes the name. So here it starts out user configuration mode. I type in my command. I type in whatever password I was set to it. Type in configure terminal or CONF space T. The host name. Now you see this is the first example you're seeing this is where the prompts are changing. Greater than sign typed in enable, the prompt changes to a pound sign, you type configuration, now it put it config, so it tells you now you're in global configuration mode. Now I type in the host name and give it a name. As you can tell, there's no spaces in these names, so you want to put dashes, underscores, or keep them all together. And then immediately, once you hit enter, the prompt change. It went from switch to what your host name is. So that way, when you're on a device, you know exactly which device you're on. So it makes it very easy when you're interfacing with a lot of different devices, which ones will make it helpful. Now, how do I limit access? I want to make sure I secure some of these devices. Now, one, you can physically lock them down, put them in a wiring closet, lock them in racks, secure them so they can't have physical access. But also, you want to... Be you know, put passwords on devices. Um, in some cases, Cisco allows you have both text where you can see the passwords or you can encrypt your password. And guess which one's probably a whole lot better for secure mode. So lock it physically away, put a password and, and encrypt it. Um, now you want to make sure the passwords you choose, as with any PC, uh, make sure they're long enough I'm not even sure eight characters is long enough anymore. I was in a session uh, last spring that uh, there are some devices out there, you know, software out there that an eight character takes about three seconds to break. So, but if you second you make it up to 10 or 11, now you're talking days. So, um, you just want to make it harder for somebody to break into your system. Now, FYI, for most of the labs in here, just so they're easy to remember, we're going to use probably Cisco or Class, all lowercase, so that way it's just a little bit easier. But I would recommend changing your passwords in the long site. So the question is now, how do I limit the access of devices? Now, 
to put in a privilege exact, I can put an enable secret password. And when I do this, it encrypts that password. So, but I could have put enable secret password, you know, would have done Now, if I wanted to change the console password so that when people log into this, how you set that up is one, I say, I got to tell them do a particular line or pretty much a, a physical interface that allowed me in. So I'm put line. I'm changing the console. Put my prom go. There it is. Sorry. Type in the word password, whatever your password is. And this is a key. If you don't put the login, it says, where, when am I going to apply? this password. I'm going to apply it when we log in to the console. Because if I don't leave, if I leave this command off, this password will just sit in the system and never be applied. Now, if I want to provide access to my teletype virtual terminals, you type in line because it's one of the access ones, VTY, because it's different than the console, and here I got a range, so I can do a range of commands. So I've got 16 different ports that I'm going to do the same password to. So I got line VTY space zero space 15, type in the password, what the password is. And also, once again, I have to tell it to type in a login. That's where I wanted to apply. Without that, it doesn't work. So here's a configuration password. So I got an evil secret. Now I'm going to put um, enable a secret. I'm getting out here all of a sudden. So I'm, I'm putting a the password's going to be class. It's going to be so I'm telling enable secret. So I'm going to encrypt it. So I'm going to do enable secret class. Type in the exit, gets out of configuration mode. I'm going to disable to get out of the exec mode. I'm going to go back into enable. Keep losing this. And all of a sudden you see a prompt. Now, one thing with Cisco, it does not give you pound signs, asterisks that you're typing things. So you have no indication that you're actually typing something in. So sometimes you just got to pay attention. If I'm doing an interface, I've got line console. Now this is, you're always going to say there's only there's usually only one console, so line console zero. Give it a password. Tell it when do I want it to apply, and the exit command gets me out of the conf line configuration. So it took me back up. So I didn't type end, which would have got me totally out of all the configuration mode. But I type exit to get me back up one level. And then put in the security and rotom access over all the virtual terminals, the virtual circuits. Here you got line VTY. Here's the range, password, and a window I want it to apply. Now, there are a couple of ways of encrypting passwords. Um, now, there's also, let me take a step back here. There are two basic configuration files. There is a startup configuration. So every time you power it up, the system wants to run this startup configuration. And then this running configuration is as you make changes to the system, I'm going to store it in this running configuration. And then until I save it, so it's while I'm running, I'm good. If for some reason I lose power, it's in the random access memory. Boom, lose power, lose everything that's written. So every now and then, you probably want to save it to the startup configuration. Now, luckily, you're doing it all in packet tracer. So whether you save it to startup configuration, cause yourself a problem, no big deal. If you're doing a physical lab, I would recommend you not save it back to the startup configuration because your next class may be, you, they don't know your password. Even though we try to keep it all relatively simple, Sometimes it doesn't happen. But one of the commands that we use is, you know, to conf to encrypt password is service password conf configure encryption. Uh, 
and it gives you a very cryptid message. So it is, but you see here, here's my show command. Show is using the display. It says I'm looking at my running configuration, what's currently that we're working with in this and in going through. If I didn't encrypt my password, you'd be able to do the show running configuration and actually see what that password is. Now, if you're logged into a system where it gives you a message, well, that's called a banner message. To so set that command up, the command is banner space message of the day, M-O-T-D, in some kind of delimiter character. That delimiter character says, I'm, I want to terminate the end of my message until I find that same delimiter message. So you want to make sure it's something that is not going to be used in the message itself. Uh, I usually like using a pound sign to say start my message and a pound sign to end it. But your choice, just make sure if, if you choose the letter E as your delimiter, you may have very short message. Now, just to, I think the, you, the system, online system gives you a syntax gesture, lets you play with a few of these commands. Um, when you get into your lab, I want you to go through and do some of these commands to, to try some out. And some of the labs is going to force you to do this. Now, I've got this running configuration. But I want to have got all these changes. I like them. I not want to. If for some reason I lose power in the system, I want to have the system boot up with these same changes. I need to save it. I need to save it from my running configuration into a con startup configuration. And the startup configuration is when I boot the system up. This is what I'm looking for to run data. So the running configuration is stored in RAM. If I lose power, you lose it. To see what is in those commands, there's a show command. It can be startup config, running config. But now if I want to save this in the startup configuration, now startup configuration is in what they call non-volatile RAM. So when I lose power, I don't lose the data. So when I bring up the system, bring it up, I'm going to go to non-volatile RAM, store that data. Now the command to copy from RAM to non-volatile RAM is the copy. So I'm doing copy, running config, to startup config. Luckily, that's a lot of typing. So luckily, if you type in copy, run, space, start, we'll do the same thing. Now, <coughs> excuse me. If for some reason you, those changes don't, give you the desired result. You can have the system rebooted back to a previous one and then say use the reload option. Now it restores the startup configuration and it'll ask you do you want to save your changes yes or no. Um, if you want you've sync saved to the startup configuration and you want to clear it all just kind of wipe off wipe off the startup configuration start over you can use the erase startup config and that'll clean up that configuration. Um, now, if you were, if you're doing a hands-on lab, I would say this is important, but if you're going to stay in the community, in the networking field, it is very crucial to say, how do I save this information? So I don't have to retype it or maybe I didn't finish my lab. Well, putty, Terra term, all allow you to capture information from, you know, in a text format so that you can reload it at a different time. So here you see example, I'm doing session. I'm going to go from session. I want to open that up. I want to do log. Do I want to log all the sessions? And then you want to say, where do I want to put my sessions? Um, when you're done, when you've captured it, maybe you want to do a show run or show config to capture all that data and then turn off that logging. That way you've just got this configuration file because this configuration file, if you boot with this, with this text file or run with this text file, 
it'll actually make all these changes for you. So it's kind of a cool way of you get halfway through a lab, you're saving it, you come back later. Uh, so it is kind of a cool way to do it. Now, so you got this text file you created to retort all the commands. To restore that configuration file to advice, you enter configuration mode. So what do you got to do? Enable, put in whatever password, config T. Once I do that, now I can copy and paste this text file into the terminal window of the switch or router. And then that all those commands have been applied. And of course, if you want to save it long term, what do you do? Copy, run, start. So you're going to get a chance to do some basic initial commands. Uh, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll pick one of these labs to uh, give you a lab. Now let's talk about some addressing scheme. Now I've got two devices. I got to make sure that they can talk. I've got to have different addresses because if you're sending an email or a letter, you've got a return address, a to address, and you need the same thing with computer networks. So you pretty much got to just get a high level one. We're going to start with what they call an IP, Internet Protocol Address Version 4. Um, and that version 4 means I'm going to put on every end device, I'm going to put some kind of address. And an address is made up of three different pieces. One that's an IP address, a subnet mask, and a subnet mask's purpose is to kind of interpret the IP address, determine what is network and what is an end device or a host device. So it's just kind of a way of interpreting because when I look at an address 192.168.110 it doesn't tell me anything. But once I do the, apply this subnet mask to it and we'll get to that a little bit later but you'll do a, a thing called anding which pretty much says I want anything that's 255 says I'm just basically copying that straight down so I got 192.168.10 because the, when I add a 0 to 10 zero times zero is anything is zero. So my network portion of this address is 192.168.1.0 and then anything that is from zero to some range means it's a host device. So this indicates network, this indicates host, and we'll go into a whole lot more later. But then there's a default gateway. A default gateway is a, pick, it's a specific device that is my outgoing device to the rest of the world. So I can have, I need to have some address that says if I'm going to go to the internet, I need to have somebody that knows how to get there. And in this case, that's what that default gateway is. Now, when I look at this IP address, it's displayed in what they call a dotted decimal notation. And it's got four digits ranging from 0 to 255. They're separated by periods. So 192.168.1.10. So dotted decimal notation. Now, there are several different interface and ports. Um, even though Cisco iOS has a lot of different ports, um, Layer 2 switches have physical ports for end devices to connect to, but they don't have uh, networking capability. Um, now, to commit to a remote device, if you want somebody to dial in, you need to create what we call a switch virtual interface, and we'll talk about that. Um, each switch has one default uh, switch virtual interface, it's VLAN 1. And for secure reasons, we'll get into that later, we'll change that for security purposes. Um, a layer 2 switch, which is mostly labs that we're going to play with, do not need any IP addressing to operate. Um, I only have that switch virtual interface IP address if I'm going to manage it remotely. Uh, how do I manually connect End device, when you're setting up something on your PC, you're going to have to right click to the adapter or the property of the local area network that you want, that interface you want to change. 
you're going to switch to an IPv4, click Properties, and then you can change the addresses as needed. Um, Windows 10 IP4 has a little bit of configuration at the end of the presentation, so pay attention to that. Uh, depends on your... Now, I can either manually set this up, which is what we did here. We did a manually IP address configuration, or I can do an automatic IP. To do that, all you had to do was change obtain IP address automatically, and then it uses a protocol called the D Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, DHCP, to predefine all the information that uh, you as an operator wants to set up. So we'll get into that uh, a lot later. Most of our devices today in the computer labs and stuff are set up with DHCP not manually configured. Um, the switch virtual interface, so now I want to remotely access into the device. I must configure VLAN 1, that interface. So the question is that switch VLAN 1 switch virtual interface must be configured with an IP address, a subnet mask, and it must be basically enabled or turned on. And we do that with all the interfaces with is using the no shutdown command. And at this one of the labs, yeah, I'll still have to divide which one I want to do. Now, how do I verify that everything's set up? On your PC, there's a command called ipconfig. So if you kind of click the search command in, in your Word and type in CMD, or actually you can type in ipconfig, and that command, it'll, it'll give you a DOS prompt and it'll let you make that changes. But that ipconfig allows me to change data or at least verify information that's in there. So we'll get into some of that a little bit later. And then to see what the interface is with all the setups and IP addressing on a switch or a router could be, you use the command show IP interface brief. And then that will give you a layout of everything. Gives you all the addresses, the interface that's on it. But how do I connect? tell if two devices are connected? I've got to see the addresses well, what I can do is use the ping command. Ping says, I'm just going to send out f bits of information and see how fast they come back to me, if they come back to me. So you're going to type in ping, and you're going to type in an IP address, a, a dotted decimal address. And then one of the labs building a simple network. Um, another lab. There's plenty of labs in this. So in this lab, you, you've figured out how to, I'm not going to go through the skills chancers, but basically understand the Cisco IOS, how to do some basic configuration, and then how to set up a configuration scheme. So hopefully this gave you a little bit of information, probably longer video than I wanted to give, but I think it'll help you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Bye-bye.